Nick Fisher, President and CEO, of Arizona Archery Enterprises. How are you, brother? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming in to Topa Talk. Um, we just missed you last year, uh, getting you at the first show. You're based right here in Prescott Valley, the world's largest manufacturer of Knox and Veins, amongst other things. I forgot, you said you had over 11,000 SKUs in your inventory. For people that don't know what a SKU is, that's a shopkeeper unit or product. So these guys have over 11,000 products in their lineup. You can check them out at ArizonaArchery.com. Super excited to have you in here. I know that this is gonna be your first year of 2023 at the Prescott Valley Outdoor Summit. Tell us a little bit about exactly who you guys are for the people that don't know. Well, are. and kind of what we say is our tree is who we are. Injection molding is what we do. Um, our business is coming up on our, into our, we're in our 52nd year of business. Com- awesome. Um, I'm third generation owner and, you know, our tree is our backbone. It's the face of the company. It's what everybody knows us as. We're the largest archery accessory company in the United States. Um, but we also do a ton of other stuff. There isn't hardly a market we don't touch um, with the pl- injection molding side of things, whether it's cell phones, automotive, medical, aerospace, um, home goods, architectural, you know, um, we like to, we like to make things and, you know, in the molding side, the plastics world, if we can make it, we want to do it. So that, that's kind of the, the basics of what we do. You know, we've uh, been here in Prescott Valley since 1977. Wow. Uh, my grandparents bought the company originally in 1971 from Max and Joel Hamilton, which they were the originators of the uh, production level plastic vein. And uh, yeah, they were 71. My family, my grandparents and my dad, and my uncle were still down in Apache Junction and they moved up here uh, again, 1977 to the same location we're at now. And we just expanded from there. You know, uh, we got into injection molding in the early 80s and then found out right away that injection molding had a lot of application. So expanded that. Uh, my dad, my uncle, or my dad, my uncle, and my grandfather went to numerous uh, expos around the, the country just trying to look at the possibilities for injection molding and found out there's so many industries that it was necessary for. Interesting. And yeah, our first customer, we still produce the same products for that we did in the early 80s in night that? vision products, uh, Litton. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Litton and Industries? Litton Industries. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. They, they make night vision products is what we do a lot of their components for. I, re- I remember the first time I was introduced to that name. It was the microwave in 1976, I think it was. Okay. I was living in Woodland Hills, California. And my dad brought home my mom this big metal box had the turn dial timer and it said, you know, do not put metal in here, which my mom did. She wrapped it. She was, I didn't know tinfoil was metal and <laughs> blew up the thing. But Lit Industries was, that's how I think that name became a, a household name. Wow. Yeah. I didn't even know they did microwaves. Yeah. Probably pre you. <laughs> yeah, probably. probably. <laughs> right. That's awesome. So were you guys doing things like Knox and veins in archery world before that or through the research that your yeah, no, forefathers it, it, did? Uh, Plasti Fletch, founded in 1958, was okay. just plastic veins. Okay. The first production level plastic vein. And then we got into injection molding to produce Knox in the late 70s. Um, then, yeah, that was just where it was the, the eyes open to the possibilities of injection molding. And even to this day, um, everything we do in injection molding funds our love for archery. We in, invest a ton of money in, into the archery industry, the, the sport itself, um, all the organizations and events to, you know, such as yours, um, right. you know, coming up here for the Prescott Valley Outdoor Summit, um, you know, uh, Injection molding provides the funds to allow us to invest into those those events and and the sport itself. So let's talk about the industry because I don't know a lot about it. Mm-hmm. Own a few guns, as a lot of us do up here in Arizona. Now, always more than wanted a few. to get into archery and target shooting and even hunting in the future. Um, the equipment looks daunting sometimes, but um, where's the industry going? Where's the growth? What do you guys see happening? It's interesting, you know, um, archery's evolved just an incredible amount, basics, basically since the turn of the century. Technology has changed so fast. I mean, just as long as tech has and software design concepts have evolved, you know, um, the abilities of the compound bow and now crossbows are just on another level that 
right. people that go back in the nineties and eighties and archery was much simpler. Um, so now I, I think now the human is evolving. We're kind of gotten to a point where I think Matthew's archery owner, um, and founder Matt McPherson put it best a couple of years ago where we're splitting hairs now in the compound bow world, you know, um, technology now to actual actually make real improvements it's expensive right um you know and you can see that just in bows now i mean a high-end bow used to be eight hundred dollars say around 2010 now they're two grand you know and and performance wise they're certainly better but the exponential value isn't there right you know whether it's the bows are a little lighter vibration is better speed not necessarily any better. Right. They might aim better. There's just more thought process and that's just from experience. But I think now again, the, the real growth in archery is in the human. Um, you know, the hybrid athlete, the right. hybrid outdoorsman with the influx of, you know, physical fitness being such a big deal to extend your range, extend your health, your abilities. You still have the same guys who, you know, they're going to climb out of their truck and walk a hundred yards and climb in a tree stand and sit there all day and eat Reese's pieces and jelly beans. But especially out here out West, um, me being one of them, you know, uh, I used to be one of those guys who wasn't in shape and the love for the back country and experiences that you can only get there if you're in shape, good right. enough shape to get there is what drove me to get in shape. And, um, th that's where archery is headed now. Right. You know, you, you have a, a really cool organization that kind of started 2010, but really has exploded in the last three or four years called the total archery challenge TAC. Okay. Um, and they're up to 10 or 11 events nationwide now. And for their first four or five years, they were just at snowbird in Utah, um, just outside of Salt Lake. And that place has exploded. You know, I'm coming from, a lot of target basis in archery and I'm used to the same 1500 shooters at every event and it's all competition based and, you know, sponsorships and sponsor deals and, and kind of like NASCAR, you know what I mean? Right. You know, with, with the belief of what wins on Sunday sells on Monday, well, these tack events, it's whole different. Nobody's, nobody's asking for anything free. It's, it is kind of you and your buddies, and but it's not like your beer drinking buddies. It's it's extreme. It's on extreme terrain, right. long shots, and these guys are here developing themselves. It's super cool to see. So let's talk about um, a little bit about the hunting world because you have a lot of folks that obviously um, dislike it but they may not know how important it is from a conservation standpoint. Can you kind of help enlighten our listeners and potential, potential bow hunters, for example, or even hunters for me, it comes back to COVID. I was never against hunting. I'm just not a hunter per se, but I think it's probably a pretty good skill to learn, especially field dressing. Mm -hmm. um, my wife and I, for fun, have a goat rescue. Um, and I hate to say it, but I was looking at those goats during COVID when there wasn't a lot of food on the table. I'm like, I got the food, but I don't know how to properly dress this stuff. And I'm thinking I'd like to go out with one of my hunting buddies who hunts um, and learn how to field dress in case we ever have an emergency because that's just practical learning. It's prat That's a practical thing to do when you see a problem address it so you're prepared and then move on. Mm -hmm. um, how important is, is it to have these taxes and these tags and hunters, how do they contribute to conservation so people know? Well, hunters are the largest influx of cash and conservationists in the United States and even in the world. I mean, you know, we can talk about the effects in Africa, but just U.S. base, you know, we have the uh, Robertson Pittman Act, which is a federal excise tax on every hunting piece of equipment sold. We, we pay an 11 percent tax and there's a few exceptions. But for the most part, everything rifle, gun, bow, accessory, we pay an 11 percent tax on those sales. And, and it's kind of sad because there's people in the industry who try to avoid that. They try to skirt games and play games with them. Right. It's, it's 
that's for the betterment of our lands. That's to extend hunting. I mean, that allows the people who represent us in Washington to have the funding and the power to make sure we have places to go to hunt. And not just for hunters. I don't care if you're a trail runner, a mountain biker, into birding. This is what keeps these federally owned lands open to the public and they're not getting sold to build apartment right. buildings on. Right. You know, this is what keeps national forests open. This is a lot of the funding that goes into it. And then, yeah, you get into hunters when they buy hunting licenses, they buy tags, they even your application fees. Even if you don't get a tag, we have to pay an application fee. All of this money and it's billions of dollars. Yeah, I know it's a lot of money. Goes to a percentage that always goes to keeping our lands open and protecting the animals. That's what I think. I want people to understand the most. Yeah. I, I agree with helping people. I think a lot of them understand that those taxes go to help keep open these parks and these open spaces. But when, when it comes to protecting the species, yeah. right? Well, Africa is a prime example for that. Um, you, you know, something fairly recent for people to understand the uh, um, the lion that was killed. Well, I don't remember that what name they gave the lion. Cecil. Cecil the lion that was killed in Africa five, six years ago by the dentist out of Minnesota. Ah. And for whatever the human's attachment is to apex predators, whether it's lions, cats, bears, um, there's some strange human attachment to an apex predator, which given the opportunity, they would happily eat you. Right. Um, it, you know, it's fine to kill a pig or a fish or a bird, but something about apex predators. But anyways... When Cecil was killed and that went nation worldwide news um, and they banned lion hunting for a short time and most hunting in Africa for a very short time, um, all of those animals suffered horrible deaths because A, they overpopulated very quickly and then poaching came in because there was no funds to defend the animals. There were no um, game wardens per se right. to keep poachers from coming in. Um because, again, I mean, not so much in the U.S., but in Africa, if you go hunt in Africa, every game species that is taken, all the meat goes to local tribes. It feeds them. It feeds their kids, their families. And it's pure meat. It's not farm-raised. People come here now and they go to McDonald's, if that even is real meat, or you go to Safeway and you buy a steak. Well, that was probably farm raised it's not pure it's full of steroids and all sorts of stuff i mean if you've ever raised chickens on your own a chicken breast isn't twice the size of your hand right there's a reason it's that big it's not it's not natural i just think it's important for people to understand the balance that the hunting world provides in terms of uh, financial in terms of environmental mm -hmm. um, and to take that away what happens yeah Right. So I, I think it's really important that when we talk about this kind of stuff, archery, firearms, whatever, because um, these days, as you know, people immediately go to, you know, the, the fear angle or the death angle when really hunters want to preserve these species so they yeah. can continue to hunt. Well, and e even then, I mean, you get into those that go, I'm vegan because I don't want to harm an animal. Have you ever paid attention when a combine comes through and cleans a field? Yeah, it's every up a animal, lot of stuff. every mole, every rabbit, every any animal in that field dies. Just have a, a little more common sense. I think that comes down to understanding and knowing, yeah. and having guys like you speak more about the facts. We just don't hear about them, right? Yeah. Or people want to be in their silos and not really hear the details of it and how it's just reality which is it's just reality and meanwhile they're going and having a fried chicken or a, yeah. a steak and you got to wonder how your cow was slaughtered yeah, yeah. right how are and it, people just got to come to grips with what feeds them and in any form things suffer and die so as a hunter a we provide funds because we want them to have the best possible environment and yes as a hunter we go for fast, clean, ethical kills. Right. They're not dying of starvation. And animals don't die of old age. 98% of animals in the wild die from a predator, a bear, a cat, something of that nature. Humans, we are an apex predator as well. We are the apex predator. But our form of killing is very clean, fashion, fast, and efficient. There's no pain. You know, um, so to just to want people to 
understand the value we bring and that we care more for the animals than they do. Absolutely. In the end, we truly do. So let's get into how does one, somebody new that's like me, that's interested in getting into uh, learning archery, where do I start? Especially in central Arizona. If I live up here in Prescott, Prescott Valley, where can I start completely from scratch to learn how to shoot a bow, maybe get involved in a group in terms of how then taking that next step, bow hunting, how do I start? So up here locally, you know, we have uh, one primary uh, uh, archery um, dealer here called Archer's Choice. Um, that that dealer has evolved from a couple, it was PB Archery, we had Mile High Archery. They've all merged over the years, but it's now Archer's Choice owned by a, a very good family um, that moved here recently in the last couple of years. They're a good group. Okay. And uh, you can walk in there at any time and they're going to, they're going to teach you the basics of archery and they're going to have a conversation with you and want to show you the value and, and let you test shoot a bow, you know, and then there's, there's other places you can go. There's actually a school across the street here, um, that over off of second street that also, um, teaches archery in its basic form. But most of the time, you know, most people learn about archery from their friends, particularly up here in our, you know, in the quad cities area, everybody knows somebody who shoots a bow and you can, Go over to their house, ask them questions. You know, certainly, I mean, I dozens and dozens of people I have introduced right. to, to archery locally just because they come over and want to be involved. And, um, you know, archery is as much a hands on word of mouth learning experience as anything. But, you know, Archer's Choice is certainly the first place. If I didn't have a friend and I just wanted to get involved, I'd, I'd walk into their Okay. The dealer there and they're right off Highway 69 and, and talk to Zach or any of his employees and, and just say, Hey man, I want to get to know about this. Can I, can I try a bow? And do they have like an indoor range or not? Yeah, they have just a a little spot you can shoot. They don't have an indoor range yet. Their new facility, they're working on expanding into that. Um, You know, and then if you're looking for a place, you can actually have a range. Um, Arizona Archery Club is down off Deer Valley in North Phoenix, uh, another great club. And they do have a a nice range, indoor range. You can go try that out as well. But, you know, we want to- Out in Chino Valley at the school. I know they got that going on. Yeah. And and the schools have NASP. You know, Chino Valley does. um, AAC has a big NASP program here. Mm -hmm. So for your kids getting involved, you can go out to our local range, Grand Mountain Archers. and they have specific hours when there's people present, but you can check in there. Lonnie Zhang is the president there and you can contact her. She's actually also my uh, head customer relations and quality control manager. Okay. And uh, certainly there's people out there who would love to get you involved as well. Awesome. So where would you start? Because you got these compound bows and if I was going to buy my first bow, what what is it? What am I looking for? I mean, I literally have no idea. The cool thing about archery is it's scalable. You know, the simplicity of a stick and string is actually still making a comeback, you know, of a recurve or a compound and just simple stick string, pull the bow back, aim and, and shoot an arrow into a, a safe location. I'm sorry. It's okay. And uh, that's, you know, trad archery. It, and just basic recurve archery is really making a comeback. And for a lot of people, that's a good place to start, you yeah. know. But again, even compound archery being so scalable, there's still bows that even new are available for $400 is what we would call a kit ready to shoot bow on RTS. And it'll have everything you need to learn how to shoot. Right. To start the basics. But it, it, I still highly recommend getting some instruction from somebody who's knowledgeable and skilled. There's so many people that you get that. Okay, here, just step up and let's draw the bow and shoot the arrow. And with no proper instruction, it's really easy for people to just not have the most enjoyable experience. It's fun the first week or two, but then you want to evolve and get better, you know, but then there's also, you know, YouTube is an amazing thing. Um, John Dudley has a really great from basics, uh, what he calls the school of knock on YouTube from knock on archery. And you can go through the school of knock and gosh, now 10 years of different, just video by video of things to work on and to grow and improve your form. You know, um, 
and there's tons of info on on YouTube for that. But it's still in the beginning, it's always good to have somebody help you with the basics, right? And to get started. Have you seen uh, an upswing in, in growth in business because of COVID and the the movement to get outdoors in combination with right just before then? This is um, I don't know 2017. I can't recall. Uh, you know, groups like Fieldcraft that were, that started out here. I know Mike's mm-hmm. moved on to like Utah and it's just grown exponentially. But we see groups like his, you know, talk about bow hunting and, mm-hmm. and being prepared because you might not always have a firearm, but just the skill itself is a great skill to know. So you've seen a lot of growth because of all these different things that have kind of just intersected at the same time. Yeah. You know, and the, it- like a lot of things in the economy and life and even archery, we, we see those seven year waves, right? Um, you know, we had the big spike 2015 from, um, uh, Katniss Everdeen and, uh, those movies. I, I, right. I forget what movies those were Twi- or not Twilight. Um, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Help us out here. Research guy, Katniss. Okay, he's rolling his Hunger, Hunger Games. Games. <laughs> Hunger, Hunger Games. Games. Thank you. Yeah. Some <laughs> sometimes things just slip my mind, but yeah, you know, we saw that big spike there in Hunger Games, and it kind of dove off there again, right? Eighteen, nineteen, and kind of things settled down a little bit, and we retained some of that, and that's where we saw a big spike from NASP, National Archery in the Schools program, and then yeah, coming into COVID, really everything in the outdoor world, of course, archery, um, firearms. But it didn't matter if it was ATVs, trucks, campers, or whatever, especially out in the West, golf, anything outdoors exploded, which was great because, yep. you know, overall, we're all outdoorsmen. We want to support yep. each other in every manner. And yeah, so we certainly saw a massive spike in, in the archery industry. Um, you know, kind of at the same time with, with Mike Glover and what he's done with Fieldcraft Survival. And you have, you know, mainstream guys like Jocko and Cam Haynes and yeah. the biggest voice on the planet, Joe Rogan, joining up with them and John Dudley. And he's just gone headfirst into it and shared his love for the outdoors. Of course, that all just does wonderful, amazing things to boost outdoorsmen. Um, Imagine Ted Nugent. Doesn't hurt either. Ted doesn't hurt, but I mean, <laughs> you know, Ted goes back into the 90s. He was kind of the voice then, 90s, 2000s. Right. And, you know, he has his little spikes where he gets involved. But Ted's pretty extreme, pretty wild. And I, I would say in some some aspects, it's kind of a little too over the top for this day and age, you know. Right. Um, again, you get into, you know, Cam's a friend of mine. He, um, he shoots our products, represents us. and But he's just a great ambassador from the aspect of building the outdoor lifestyle, you know, whether it's running or just living life outside and how to make it a part of your life. You know, up until recently, he had a nine to five right? forever. You know, he worked for his little local water company and still ran. He was the face of undercar or under armor run forever. So just those types of people of just showing how this is just my life. This right. is, I provide food to my family. Archery is, it's just a place of relaxation. You know, I start my day every day. Now I, I wake up and within 20 minutes, I'm shooting arrows and Zen, yeah. watching the sunrise. You know, it's, how do we get skills like this in front of our school kids? Cause I just think number one, it gets them out mm-hmm. when we know they're inside too much and they're on their phones too much. It develops, you know, hand-eye skills and coordination. Um, it then leads to other things, but it's really about being around other people as well. How do we, we're involved with the school districts on a variety of mm-hmm. different levels. Um, how can we get the industry in front of them and get them out and learn, teach them how to? Well, ultimately school districts are not, it starts with the parents. Right. It starts with the parents and just cultivating the outdoor lifestyle. And the values it brings, you know, I raise, I have two daughters, five and 15, and I've raised them outside. My daughter is, my oldest is a 15, a very accomplished hunter and outdoorsman herself, loves being outside. And yep. she's still a 15 year old girl that will stay up till 2 a.m. on her phone. Yep. But hunting and camping season comes around. That's all she wants to do. That's awesome. Because we, you know, as a young, a young child instilled the out the outdoor lifestyle and those core memories. Yep. And to me, yes, there's, there's things absolutely the schools can do, but it comes down to the parents and us just teaching them 
the values of it. And, you know, I love hunting, but I grew up, I hunted for 10 years before I ever harvested my first animal. Right. Never stopped me from wanting to do it. Yeah. My, my best memories, you say core memories was my folks taking us to Catherine's Landing, Lake Mojave in the early seventies, you know, before there was a Laughlin and, um, just being outdoors, camping, water skiing, the water skiing for me led to being, being around water, which led to learning how to scuba dive and getting my open water certification at 14. This is an open ocean. And it wasn't one of those holiday classes. It was like a three month class and mm-hmm. it was conditioning and everything else. And that led to much later in life, the, um, the challenge of becoming a pilot and getting my pilot certificate. It just leads to other things that you just don't know because it's a challenging skill, right? And it's, it can be physically challenging. But these core memories early and challenging our kids and our families to get out and do these things, I think that's getting lost in all this distraction. Technology. See, right? Technology. Technology. Yep. You know, get unplugged. Yep. Get, get unplugged. Un- get outside, get unplugged. You know, I, one of my, just favorite things is take the kids away from Wi-Fi. Take ourselves from away from Wi-Fi. I'm I'm just as bad as they can be at times. I know you get caught up in it. And that's why we created the Prescott Valley Outdoor Summit. Number one is to promote all the different businesses in the outdoors industry, like Arizona Archery Enterprises, and let people know about the different manufacturers that are in the region, but also to get people outside and unplugged and hopefully they do. We had an app last year for the show. I said, why are we doing an app? We don't need an app. We got a website if they need to see it, but let's just get them outside. Just come out and walk around. It's right. not that big of a place. It's not that big of a place. We're super stoked to have you guys. We really appreciate your participation. Hopefully you'll grow with us as we continue to invest in the Prescott Valley Outdoor Summit. Um, Will you come back again and talk more about your industry? Because you're apparently the guy to talk to. When it, I mean, I, I didn't know who I was talking to at Colt. I really didn't. Uh, I just knew when I first ran into you guys at the bar eating lunch last year, just like what, two weeks before the show, because I saw your logo shirts, Mike, I thought you were engineers, right? Because mm-hmm. you had that the shop shirts on. I'm like, wait a minute, you're the guys we've been calling on. I think you guys were in some transitional phases and whatever. And we was our first year, but finally we guys, we finally partnered up. We're excited to have you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It'll be fun. And yeah, you actually caught my cousin, um, yep. James, who's also he's part of my marketing team and he's also one of my head uh production supervisor now. And um I know you guys connected. Yeah, we were in an interesting transition last year in our marketing phase. And I was in a transition of buying the company. And and so my availability was very slim. Gotcha. So, um, but he he made it a point to go and and see the event. I was actually out of town during the event. And, uh, but he he made a point to to go to the event and put in a good word to me to make sure awesome. we met up and you had contacted me a couple of times this year. And I was just in my, one of my busy stretches and obviously it was meant to be catching me there at Colt again. And at Colt, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's right across the street from my office. So I kind of get stuck there. It's kind of easy to fall into that place. Nick I can Fisher. smell it from my shop. <laughs> I <know>. So <laughs> hey, hey, I got to keep my, my widow close. Nick Fisher, president and CEO, Arizona Archery Enterprises. Thanks for coming to Topo Talk. We'll see you at the 2023 Prescott Valley Outdoor Summit. We appreciate you. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank All you right. for having me. All right. Take care.